Um, in, not in this particular order, but uh, I can tell you we're going to hear from uh, Danielle Aguir, who is the Senior Vice President um, at the National Music Publishers Association. And um, I'm going to leave it at that, just place these people very briefly in perspective for you. Our speaker is Catherine Oyama, who is Senior Copyright Police Counsel at Google. I think that speaks for itself. Um, Usman Ahmed, who um, is Policy Counsel at eBay. If any of these firms is unknown to you, you should leave now. Um, David Olson, who is a uh, prof uh, professor of law at uh, Boston College uh, Law School and writes in uh, intellectual property generally. Um, and Mark Schultz, who is a law professor uh, at Southern Illinois uh, School of Law and a uh, member of the um, Academic Advisory Board of the Copyright Alliance. Now that said, um, we will hear first, uh, and in this order, from um, uh, Mr. Schultz, uh, then from uh, Mr. Usma, uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, third from Ms. Oyama, uh, fourth from Mr. Olson, and um, finally from Ms. Aguirre. After each of the five has had an opportunity to uh, lay out their views, uh, we'll begin the crosstalk. The general theme is going to be whether the uh, copyright uh, laws need uh, uh, legislative reform, and if so, of what kind and to what degree. So we'll start with Mark Schultz. Judge, and thanks to the Federal Society for organizing this panel. So, the first question, does copyright need to be revised for the 21st century? Uh, perhaps, uh, this is a question, this is a piece of conventional wisdom one hears a lot when one works in this field. You know, everyone from cab drivers to investment bankers you meet, they say, oh, copyright, that's kind of getting outdated. And being a law professor, I ask that annoying question, why do you think so? And they'll say, uh, the internet? Um, and when I hear that response, I, I often think that the internet doesn't necessarily change things. It's, it's a facile response. Uh, and we have to look deeper uh, at, whether, at the question of whether law can flexibly adapt to technological and social change. And in principle, it can. Uh, in principle, well-drafted laws don't easily get outdated. And let me channel Richard Epstein here, because he can't be on every panel, but I can invoke him at least. <laughs> so, as, as Richard has argued, uh, the, the laws that pr best protect society, the best preserve a free society, are uh, simple rules for a complex world. Uh, Well-drafted laws are based on simple rules that protect individual autonomy, uh, the acquisition of property, the transfer of property by private contract, and laws and rules that protect persons and property from aggression, from misappropriation of their property by means of tort law. So property, contracts, tort, these are the simple rules for a complex world. Given these principles, courts, and more importantly, private parties, through private ordering, can deal with a vast array of incredibly complex and rapidly changing circumstances. So in principle, copyright can be such a law. In practice, though, the problem is that it's not. In practice, copyright is an over-regulated regime with regulation that has its roots in the progressive era, uh, the through the imposition of compulsory licenses in the 1909 Act, uh, in outdated consent decrees that arose in the Roosevelt administration, um, that govern prices and practices in the industry. There is not a free market in copyrighted content. Um, it's also shot through with time and technological, technologically contingent exceptions. Uh, the government's deeply involved in setting prices. So just to be clear, songwriters and record labels generally don't get to set their own prices. And often the producers of television programs don't get to set their own prices. Um, and so 
what we have is a copyright act that is far from a set of simple rules for a complex world. Simple rules that preserve a free society. And so uh, in offering principles for copyright revision, I keep these simple rules in mind. My first principle, though, is do no harm. There are two directions this revision could go. Right now, one of the problems we have with copyright is we have the worst of both worlds, believe it or not. We have a regulatory statute without a real regulatory agency. I, the Copyright Act, in the back sections of it, once you get past the simple sections you would learn in, in an intellectual property survey course, is incredibly complex. It looks like the tax code in places. But there's no regulatory agency to govern it. The more we move in the direction of regulation, the worse it gets. So do no harm if we're going to move further away from the principles of property, contract and torts, of free exchange uh, between autonomous individuals who set their own prices and decide what's best for the, themselves. If we're moving away from those principles, then we should stop. So first, do no harm. Now my second principle, which I hope will resonate with this audience, is deregulate copyright. Let's return to a property system. Look, we have consent decrees. Uh, the longest running consent decree, antitrust consent decrees in American history uh, governing ASCAP and BMI. Uh, help that govern the prices they can charge for performance of their music. In an increasingly complex um, environment with great opportunities and potentially great new business models were hampered by the music businesses by, by performing rights organizations inability to negotiate on behalf of their members in a free market. Um, we also have compulsory licensing throughout the Copyright Act. You know, the hallmark of a property right is exclusive use and control. Uh, the ability to say no to others who want to interfere with your use and your plans for your property. The ability, consequently, to set your own prices. We need to get rid of this compulsory licensing in the Copyright Act. Um, and so, the, uh, keep in mind that, as I said, a lot of this compulsory licensing, this compulsory licensing in the Copyright Act dates back to the 1909 Act. It was enacted in response to problems between music publishers and piano roll companies. Remember piano rolls? I don't. They were before our time. But we're still living under a regime that governs ancient technology, that was prompted by ancient technology. It was probably wrong then, but it's even more wrong for a digital online world. Uh, we need to get rid of this progressive error digital, um, digital, th th this progressive error compulsory licensing and reform reform uh, music licensing to allow for a free market for the digital era. Now, my third principle is responsibility. Um, yes, we need voluntary transactions in the market, but also, if somebody knowingly appropriates another's property or facilitates or benefits from the appropriation of another's property, then one should be responsible for one's actions. Now, Copyright worked better when it incorporated these same types of protections that other property rights regimes have under the tort system. Now that we've moved away from that, we are not holding people as accountable. So we've moved away from tort principles and criminal law principles for that matter that accomplices are held accountable for committing crimes or torts. And we, we should hold people accountable for assisting others with committing infringement. Now, in the late 90s, we made some amendments to Copyright Act, co the Copyright Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, to better secure the rights of creators in the digital context. And we made some compromises with uh, emerging digital industries, with internet service providers. Um, and the system worked for a while. It allowed the emergence of things like iTunes, which uh, the record labels and uh, publishers could depend on iTunes. Um, enacting DRM, uh, digital rights management. It gave enough breathing space uh, to curb some of the lawlessness in, on the online world uh, to allow for something like iTunes to emerge. But that system has had unintended consequences. It insulates service providers from f for who are providing a platform for infringing content, knowingly providing that platform and profiting from it. 
Um, and I could get into the technical details of how the Digital Millennium Copyright Act works. Everybody up here knows it well. Many of you in the audience do. But for the uninitiated, it, it, uh, it, I need not do that. Because what I'd like to say is that simple rules can address these problems. We need to go back and revert to the importance of protecting property rights and holding people account accountable for their infringing activities. So with these principles, do no harm, uh, deregulate copyright, and hold people responsible for their, for their knowing and intentional actions, uh, I think we could get back to a system that works well. Um, and with that, I leave it to my next colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the Federalist Society for inviting me to speak on this very esteemed panel and very exciting and interesting topic that I spend a lot of my time at eBay thinking about. Um, and this question is a, is a big one and a broad one. How can we rethink Copyright Act in a digital age? And I thought the best way to kind of tackle it was rather than, than speak at a, at a holistic level to look at a particular case study um, to try to grapple why this, this issue is so timely and difficult to, to handle. And I want to look at a particular section of the Copyright Act, namely Section 109A, uh, which many in the audience who are copyright experts will know is the first sale doctrine, which is basically an exception uh, to the distribution right uh, that is granted to copyrights owners, um, which namely provides any purchaser lawful owner of a product uh, is able to resell that product, give that product away, lend that product without first obtaining permission from the copyright owner. And so this is the uh, doctrine that basically enables wholesalers to buy, uh, let's say, a set of books from an author and then sell the, that set of books to a retailer at whatever price uh, the wholesaler deems appropriate and then the retailer to sell that product on to a consumer and then even that consumer to sell that product or give that product away uh, to the Salvation Army. And all of those individual transactions are underlying those is, is this first sale doctrine and this exception that prevents a copyright owner from coming in and saying, uh, I control the distribution here, you don't get to control the distribution. And so the first sale doctrine has been a, a principle in the US in common law uh, dating back to a 1908 a uh, Supreme Court case that was the first one to really recognize it. And even going further back than that, uh, it really derives from the statute of Westminster uh, 1290, I believe, in England, um, where uh, the principle against restraints on alienation was codified. And so this first sale doctrine really captures all of that and, and, and is being put to under tremendous stress uh, in the digital age. And I think it provides a helpful um, kind of case study to, to, to tackle this problem. So what's happening? What's happening is that the books and music and movies that we've all enjoyed in physical form are now being transitioned into digital form. So I'm sure many of you have downloaded an ebook from Barnes & Noble or Amazon or, or bought iTunes music uh, or have downloaded a movie from Amazon and, and watched it. Um, and those, those digital products, those digital downloads actually have two unique problems that I imagine the authors of the Copyright Act in 1976 or even before that ha weren't thinking about uh, when, they, when they drafted the first sale doctrine. Uh, the first one is that when I transfer a digital product, so if I download an iTunes song and I, I want to transfer it to, to Judge, uh, Judge Ginsburg, um, there would, it would presumably create a reproduction. So I would upload that song to the internet and then Judge Ginsburg would download it. And when I upload that song to the internet, a new file is created, a reproduction, and the first sale doctrine doesn't cover reproductions. And so it would potentially be a violative of, of copyright law in that way. And then secondly, uh, I'm sure many of you have noticed that when you buy these songs or buy movies or music or books, you click this I agree little symbol. And that I agree subjects you to a license. Um, and so you're not actually buying the product, you're licensing it. Um, and that's very important because uh, Section 109A in the, in the Copyright Act, the First Sale Doctrine, 
states that it only applies to owners of goods. So only owners of goods are able to be, to use that exception and, and claim that they can resell the products or give those products away. And a license would presumably make them ineligible for that. So that all of this material really came to a head uh, last year in a case before the Southern District of New York called Capital Records versus Redigi. And in Capital Records versus Redigi, an innovative startup company named Redigi uh, created a platform for people to trade their uh, iTunes music. Um, and the way that it did that was very similar to what I described. You would upload your music to the Redigi cloud. It would color your hard drives to make sure that there were no copies of that music. And then it would enable a transfer. And the Southern District of New York found that, no, this created a reproduction. Every time somebody uploaded their music to the cloud and somebody downloaded it, that was a reproduction. You can't claim first sale doctrine. Uh, it's an infringing service. And so Redigi was, was subjected to a, a, an adverse ruling. Um, and so, uh, you know, presumably that was the end of the story, but actually Redigi has rebranded itself and relaunched as Redigi 2.0, um, and they have a, a slightly different model for, uh, for handling transfers that would presumably resolve this difficult reproduction issue. And what it does is, uh, let's say I want to trade some music, I would sign into the Redigi account, and my song that I buy from iTunes wouldn't actually go to me, it would go to the Redigi cloud and then my access to that song could be transferred. So there would only be one file that would exist and people would be able to transfer their access. So resolving the, the difficult problem with reproduction, presumably enabling people to transfer their songs. And I would note that Amazon and Apple and other companies are, are looking into these models to be able to, to uh, create these marketplaces for digital goods transfers. But that doesn't resolve the licensing issue, and, and that's a very important issue and one that, that is the subject of litigation, is how do licenses apply? And so the Ninth Circuit in Werner versus Autodesk determined that those types of software licensing and, and music licensing uh, are binding, and you can't, you can't simply say that the first sale doctrine applies because the license says you are not the owner of the product, so you're not eligible for the first sale doctrine. Uh, copyright scholars from around the country have been critical of that, of that set of reasoning because they believe that uh, preemption, uh, the doctrine of preemption, you can't simply contract around a copyright uh, limitation or exception. And they cite to actually the first case I mentioned uh, that talks about the first sale doctrine is from 1908, and it's a fascinating case because it's super relevant now, uh, called Bob's Merrill versus Strauss. And in that case, uh, a, 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 a author of a book wrote on the inside cover of the book, you cannot sell this book for less than one dollar. It's kind of funny to think about a book that costs a dollar, but that's what they cost in those days. And Macy's uh, sold the book for less than a dollar. And so the author uh, sued Macy's and the court said, no, uh, you know, you can't simply contract out an exception. Uh, and we want people to be able to freely trade products. We don't want complete downstream control. So. Macy's was found to be not liable and those goods were, were found to be transferable. And so to your question, to, to, to Professor Schultz's earlier point, yes, there's new technology, but there are classical legal questions. And this is one of them at the heart of this debate is a, a very important question. Do we want to incentivize copy, or we obviously want to incentivize copy owners to create and create new works, but we also want to have a free market in, in kind of transferring of those products. And so it's a, it's a very difficult classical question that's being put to the test in the digital age. And the last thing I'll say um, is just to add another wrench to the complexity in this particular issue is uh, that it's not just limited to digital goods and music and movies. More and more products today have a software component in them. Uh, so you think about the Internet of Things, uh, you, you think about a thermostat like the Google Nest product. It's a physical thermostat, but it has software in it. And presumably that software could be subject to a license, and that license could prevent people from transferring those products. So this problem is, is going to be huge. It hasn't been decided yet. Uh, Representative Blake Farenthold from Texas has introduced a bill in Congress to potentially uh, revise Section 109A and, and at the very least recognize these physical products that have a digital component that they are eligible for for sale doctrine protection. And so you're starting to see policymakers look into some of these issues and try to, to create a, a policy solutions to them. But it's, 
it's a very difficult problem and it's one that's only going to be continuing to grow as the internet and technology kind of proliferate every single physical and digital product that we touch. So I don't have a great set of principles for how to address that, but it is, you know, I do contend that it is a, a growing and a, an increasingly interesting and, and difficult problem. So thanks. Hi, my name is Katie Oyama. I work um, with Google on copyright and trademark policy in the Washington office, um, along with my colleague Lee Dunn, who's right up there in the um, front and center. Thanks so much for coming in this afternoon. Thank you, Judge Ginsburg, for moderating. Um, so I thought maybe I'd just start um, with sharing a little bit of a recap of kind of where we see copyright policy today, um, and then try to answer a couple of those questions about what um, first principles might drive um, this discussion of copyright review over the next couple of years, and are there places where we think um, there might be room for improvement? Um, so I think on the first, the first topic of just kind of what's the snapshot of where we are today, um, I think for folks that have, you know, kind of toiled away in this narrow copyright space, one of the things that's um, exciting to see is a growing awareness from um, kind of a large sector of the American public that copyright law and copyright policy really does shape and affect the types of services that we all use um, and interact with every day. So I think that's one of the things that we saw with kind of the, um, for Washington, somewhat surprising, extremely large public response um, to the SOPA legislation a couple of years ago. You had kind of an unprecedented bipartisan, um, you know, really grassroots movement um, protesting and saying this is an example where the government regulatory framework would really be overreaching and stretching too far. And you saw, you know, groups on the left, you saw the ACLU, you saw um, lots of folks, um, Heritage, um, ATR, Freedom Works, um, a lot of thought leaders from various sectors um, looking at this and I think speaking up and saying, we may have actually reached a point where we're starting to get out of balance and what are the ways in which we could kind of draw these laws back in um, to achieve first principles. And I think from our perspective, when we think about first principles, I think, you know, consistent with kind of um, the founders intent, constitutional principles, and just kind of what are the US economic needs when we're reviewing policy, we always try to think, if we were thinking from the top of what types of policies would really promote creativity and promote innovation, if that was our ultimate goal, what would the set of US kind of law and policy look like? Um, and so I'd say kind of high level, I think we're doing pretty well um, in the US. We have places where I think you'd have Many different people say we're not perfect and there's a lot of smart proposals that will be put on the table over the next couple of years where potentially we could refine. But overall, we have in the United States a system where, um, you know, and I think in large part thanks to the DMCA, which Congress passed in the late 1990s, a system where, you know, the US internet economy, I think, is the envy of, um, you know, many countries in the world. And the DMCA is largely credited for allowing um, entrepreneurs and startups um, to flourish. There's very clear rules there. At the same time, content is thriving. So there's more content being created now than ever before. Um, we're seeing upticks in you know, digital revenues from various different content spaces. Um, and so the US has overall developed a framework where, where creators can flourish, um, tech and new businesses and entrepreneurs can flourish. Um, so I think approaching any changes with the understanding that the U.S. is doing a relatively good job here and that the law does reflect careful balances and we need to be careful as we move forward. Um, I think especially at this time where a lot of our challenges as a U.S. economy are um, more drastic changes that are being proposed abroad. Um, so in trade agreements or in um, especially a bunch of European proposals where copyright is being used um, quite offensively in those countries to target US companies um, and to use copyright law to, for purposes of things like trade protectionism or to add additional taxes um, to the general types of businesses that US companies can do here under the law um, just fine because we have protections. Um, so I think we wanna be careful. We'd love to see, you know, um, especially in these foreign conversations, US policymakers being 
quite strong on um, some of the important balances that the US law addresses. Um, so taking that aside, I think you know there's always places to look at where we might be able to improve. Um, I think one of the places is kind of looking at the market and evaluating the extent to which copyright law has really developed an extremely fragmented, complex, somewhat opaque system, regulatory system that makes it incredibly difficult to license um, content even when it's authorized. And ultimately that doesn't help anyone. So it doesn't help service providers that are trying to share content with users. It doesn't help creators. Um, and so there may be places there where we can look and seek consensus on are there ways to make ownership information more available, more transparent, more accurate so that the markets can work and that when people want to be paid and when services want to pay them, are there ways that we could do that um, more easily and more readily identify who are the copyright owners um, so that we can license the works in a way that seems authentic and okay with those rights holders. Um, I think that the issue of kind of litigation, potential abuse of litigation under copyright law and the damages regime is something that um, I think for us as we especially spend more time in um, pockets of venture capital and investment, I think there was you know, a good amount of conversation in the patent space over the last couple of years. I think folks are starting to look at the copyright system as well. Of course, we want to have strong rights and protections um, for rights holders, but there, there may be, I think, places in the law that can be identified where these legal tools are being used to threaten new startups um, or new businesses. It's extremely easy under the copyright system. Um, you know, as we develop products and as Google think about going to market, it's quite easy to do a little um, math and, and apply it against the statutory damages regime and, and we have to tell our internal stakeholders this could be you know, a multi-billion dollar mistake if we get it wrong um, because of the amount of content out there and the way that the damages kind of increase exponentially. Um, and that's one thing if you have relatively deep pockets as a larger company, it's much more scary if you're a young entrepreneur and you're starting out and you're seeking venture capital investment. Just the mere threat of a lawsuit um, can be quite chilling and damaging to your idea. Um, I'd say one of, the, just one of the last principles to think about in this space is what is the appropriate balance between the government's role and the government regulation and that approach versus um, encouraging and pushing forward more voluntary-based, you know, private sector solutions. And I think one of the things that's really nice to see, you know, absent large legislation in the last couple of years, um, is the extent to which a lot of different entities in the private sector are partnering, are working together um, to boost revenues for their creative industry, to find better tools um, using, using digital tools to enforce IP online. Um, last year as Google, we took down something like 220 million um, links out of search based on this collaboration that we have under the DMCA with rights holders. Um, so as we develop these tools, um, in some ways, I think the private sector can kind of grow leaps and bounds. And at, at the time that you would actually pass <laughs> a regulatory approach of how to do that, it's going to already be outdated. So are there ways that we can encourage people to work together? Um, and then lastly, I'd say, when we're talking about copyright, um, always thinking about are there better ways that we can serve the markets and get compelling content to users in a way that they will um, choose authorized content you know, over piracy and infringement. And that's something that I think no one person in this ecosystem can do alone, um, but something that partnership um, is really needed. And we're very excited um, at Google through Play, at Google Play and, and YouTube um, and Search to always be thinking about are there smart kind of market-based ways that we can push content um, out to users. So thanks so much. Hi, uh, thanks as well. I want to thank the Federal Society for having me here. I actually serve on the uh, leadership committee uh, for the IP group, and this semester I teach a class uh, on the, the regular time of the scheduled calls, and so I haven't been joining in on the calls, and so after one call I got an email saying, 
Oh, you're going to be speaking at the National Convention on Copyright Law. So, uh, you know, I see, the, I see what happens when you, when you miss the calls. So, <laughs> with that in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do what I can. Um, I've always liked the quote, just to pick up on something Katie said. Um, uh, she said, uh, you know, we need to work towards consensus. I've always liked the quote that says, consensus is the last refuge of scoundrels. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to add, uh, bring in some, some lack of consensus here and maybe take some positions that uh, are contrary to some of what's been said. After all, these things are never any fun when everyone just kind of agrees and whatnot. Um, now, some of what I have to say actually does overlap with what's already been said, uh, uh, with what Katie said uh, particularly. But uh, as a colleague of mine said uh, during a break in a faculty meeting once, I said, I think the meeting's about over because I think everything that could be said pretty much has been said. Uh, and he said to me, oh no, no, that might be the case, but not everyone has had a chance to say it yet. <laughs> so let me have my chance now. Uh, I have in my you know, seven, eight minutes remaining, I have a mere eight points uh, that I think we should think about when we reform, uh, think about reforming copyright law. First, the, to the question, should we reform copyright law? Absolutely. Uh, it absolutely is in need of reform. Uh, it, it's a very detailed, very complex regulatory system that has been created at certain instances in time where the ways that we, that content is created and delivered to the public is very specific to those times of creation. And as that has changed, such a complex system is going to have to be revised. I teach patent law as well as intellectual property generally. The, in, the patent law statute is like this and the copyright statute is like that. So it's enormously more uh, detailed in its regulation. It's going to have to be updated from time to time. Here are the main themes I think we need to think about in reforming copyright law. Number one is that copyright is a utilitarian tool. It's not a property right, this is where I'll disagree with Mark, that needs to be ever more protected. Instead, copyright gives uh, uh, us the right to control what others do with their own time, with their own talent, often in the privacy of their own private property, uh, using their own private chattel property. So copyright gives uh, rights owners, the rights owners, right? So people who are entitled to these kind of monopoly uh, protections, the right to say, hey, federal marshals, go stop that person from singing this song because that's mine, right? And we do it for a good reason because we think we're better off if people have incentives to create songs and books and music. But we need to recognize that the way we've created an incentive is we've said, uh, Hello, federal government, please get much more involved in business and all of our lives, uh, and not in the way that we need you to get involved in the case of private property where we're going to end up fighting about it because only one person can you know, eat the same apple or farm the same piece of land. With non-rivalrous IP, uh, we are inviting the government in for purposes of utilitarian uh, uh, incentives, not because uh, by nature, by some sort of natural light, rights, we need to protect uh, uh, these, these IP entitlements. So number two is we need to balance that incentive against the welfare of the public, right? So uh, whenever you give monopoly rights, it's going to result in monopoly profits, if uh, prices, uh, at least if there's market power. Uh, to look at that, you just need to look at the price of penguin books, right, compared to other books. When you can simply print out books that are in the public domain, uh, they're much cheaper. Uh, when it comes to the public, the public also has speech interests in, in other people's copyrighted works. Sometimes you need to quote from someone to really uh, indulge your speech. Uh, there's interest in criticism, in remixing, in mashing up. Some of this stuff I don't really understand and I think is maybe not that useful or weird, but right, just because we're older and we don't understand it doesn't mean uh, necessarily that it's, it's not valuable for human flourishing. Number three, it's generally bad public policy to have laws that criminalize the behavior of a substantial portion of the population, especially if that portion of the population is a substantial portion of the, uh, a substantial bit of the next generation, right? So it's bad uh, if lots of uh, people do things that are illegal and think, well, it's not a, uh, not a big deal. It leads to less respect for law, less commitment to enforcement of law. And so I worry that we have teenagers and college students who are out there and there are all these laws on the books, some of which are treated quite seriously, alcohol laws, others, copyright laws. And lots of these uh, young people are saying, you know what, this is just, you know, the way you have to do life and the way you have a good time is you're just a lawbreaker. That's just how we go about it, right? Um, 
we, you know, th th they can distinguish between some kinds of laws and other, but nevertheless, a, a regime that depends on its enforcement to make what seems like not a big deal to lots of people, oh, I want to share this music with a friend, you know, I want to show something to them, uh, making that illegal isn't the best way to do a system. We may have to do some of that, but we should try to avoid it where we can. Number four, the digital internet age, uh, to, to answer Mark, it's changed everything. Everything is different. No, not everything is different, but it's changed a lot, right? So it's, it costs virtually zero now, once a work has been created, to share it and to distribute it, right? It, it costs virtually zero. As marginal cost for something goes to zero, a lot of the way we think about distributing that content should change. Right? As marginal cost of distribution goes to zero, we should think about a lot of things, and this can have some, uh, some consequences that we may not foresee. So uh, I think Usman's actually wrong. Uh, going to our digital first sale is a bad idea because as marginal cost for distribution goes to zero, if we let people have more control and more price discrimination, then they'll sell to some people for more money and to other people who value the work a lot less but if they can control the sale and prevent resale, they will sell to those people for a very small price, and that's a good thing. Okay, number five, um, oh, well, still on number four, right, uh, and another response to Mark is uh, the fact that the, the, that the internet has changed so much that people can now create, can be creative uh, and, and use, uh, put works out there on the internet for others to engage with is a wonderful thing, right? You don't have to have a big production company behind you. Um, a lot of this work ends up using copyrighted material from others. Well, you know, that could be potentially problematic. It means all of this work is technically infringing, potentially illegal, um, but a lot of that work also does not displace any sales of that underlying copyrighted work. Here's an example. My daughters, Grace and Annabelle, love Taylor Swift. They're having trouble with her new move to pop, right, from country, but they're getting on board. They have made numerous videos where they dance to Taylor Swift and act out her videos. Um, they, they would like to put them on YouTube, but because of privacy issues and their father's an IP professor, right? He says, no, you can't share these. Taylor Swift would lose no sales, right, to this video with, with her song playing in poor quality in the background going up on, on YouTube, but it would be not allowed. Um, you know, maybe that's just a cost of having copyright and, and being able to encourage Taylor to write these songs, but I think maybe we could try strike a balance that's a little bit better. Okay, um, number five, because everything on the internet basically involves copying and may also qualify as public uh, performance or display, uh, it means copyright's gonna come in and there might be multiple ways to stop uh, behavior. That can be both good and bad. It's something to keep in mind. Number six, uh, if, if this question is, you know, if, if only we could have some way to say, all right, some copying, ooh, almost out of time, some copying is uh, okay maybe even, right? Maybe it would be okay. This is kind of against the property rights. You know, I get to do whatever with my property. You never have any uh, uh, say in it. If only it'd be okay maybe for purposes of comment or criticism or news reporting or if you're going to do something really transformative with an underlying copyrighted work, if you could have that right, you know, you, 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 would, you could have that right to do that. Wouldn't that be... Nobody's on board? Okay, that right exists actually under the Copyright Act, under Section 107 of the Copyright Act. It's called fair use. The problem with fair use is you uh, apply a four-factor test asking about, you know, how much did you use, what's the nature of the work, the purpose and character, the effect on market value, and this four-factor test is famously fuzzy. Uh, uh, it, it amounts, in Larry Lessig's words, to a right to hire a lawyer to tell you whether your use is fair. That's not very useful, right? So. We've got this idea out there that there should be these privileged uses of copyrighted material, but we've got a system that doesn't uh, often allow it, especially for lower valued, user, lower valued uses. Another thing that any copyright reform has to take into account is number seven, orphan works. Because now every uh, thing that's been created since 1923 is potentially in copyright if it was registered, if it was renewed, and it's really hard to figure that out. And because you're not required to uh, record your assignments of copyright, you can later go back and, and sort that out later when you sue someone. Uh, there are all these works out there where you might want to make use of something from 1940, but you don't know who the copyright owner is, you can't find the copyright owner, and you're afraid to use that work because of number eight, statutory damages. Statutory damages, this, if we were talking a property rights system, statutory damages are nothing like typical property rights. Statutory damages says that for every infringement of a, of a copyright, 
you can be charged between $750 and $30,000, and in special cases, we could raise that up to $150,000 each. So statutory damages uh, make it so that no one wants to touch orphan works, amongst other things, because you might get hit with statutory damages later. It, 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 these can allow the kind of copyright trolling problem uh, that some people think exists in patent law. So this disallows kind of efficient breach kind of approach where you can make more, add more value and then pay off the original owner later. Uh, it deters use of orphan works. So these are the things we should think about. I have some thoughts on the remedies, which I may have to, or on, the, on how to fix copyright, which I'm, I guess I'll have to get to maybe in the question and answer. Uh, but my main, I guess, the main thing I was gonna focus on for this talk is that uh, if we get rid of statutory damages and go to an actual damages system and also allow injunctions, make people prove it up, have ideas of proximate cause and whatnot, uh, we could have uh, a fair use that would happen, we could have efficient kind of breach that would happen, uh, and, and it would be, you know, a, a better world. And before you think this is crazy, you can't do that with an IP right, that's basically what we do in patent law. Right in patent law, we don't have crazy statutory damages. We just say you get actual damages and you get an injunction. And okay, if we wanted treble damages like they do in patent law, fine. That would, uh, that would be okay and we wouldn't have all this um, really chilling of creative work and expression that happens under statutory damages. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Danielle Aguirre, and uh, just to explain a little, I'm from the National Music Publishers Association, perhaps not as well known as Google or eBay, um, but we represent music publishers and songwriters. And I think this is good that I go right after Professor Olson because I think we will differ a little bit in our opinions of uh, intellectual property and how it should be viewed. Um, I, I think I would agree on one thing, which is copyright law definitely needs to be reformed, but I would say that the principle that needs to guide that reform would be to, in fact, treat intellectual property and copyright in the same way that we treat real property. And actually, I would say that that's the best way to ensure that there's value to all people within the chain, both copyright owners, you know, future content creators, as well as users. And you know, weakening copyright law does not increase economic benefits. It does not increase access to works. In fact, weakening copyright law will weaken professional class of creators that I believe the founders really envisioned um, when they created the copyright, you know, constitutional copyright protection. Um, you know, with all due respect to YouTube and, and Google, I don't think the founders were thinking of a world in which everyone created you know, UGC content and uploaded it for 100 million people to see. I think what they, what they were trying to protect with copyright law was really you know, a, a professional class of creators who were able to profit from and live off of their work so that they could create works that would add to and influence culture and society and add to the growth of our society. And you can't do that without strong copyright law. And so if you weaken copyright law, you weaken both the quality and the quantity of the works that the users and consumers have access to. Um, strong copyright laws can coexist with new technology. In fact, strong copyright law will enable people to continue to create truly valuable works that can then be accessed in a way that I don't think the founders ever envisioned with new technology. Um, and so I think treating creative works as one treats real property is really the best way to ensure continued true value throughout the chain, both with the original creator, with perhaps future creators that wanna use those works in new derivative works, as well as to consumers who wanna access those works and actually benefit from them. Um, to get a little bit more specific in terms of what kinds of reform, I think I would stick to two principles, especially given the timing. The first meaning, you have to maintain copyright protection, but you really have to make it easier for copyright owners to enforce their rights, um, particularly in the area of online infringement. Um, copyright law, I would agree, in some ways has never been stronger, but the inability to enforce 
those protections makes a lot of those laws effectively meaningless for most copyright owners. And, and I can you know, take from experience with our songwriters that we represent. Um, when you look at the online piracy that happens and that goes on on many digital platforms, uh, y you have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which both in its language and the way that it has been interpreted, allows platforms essentially to create a platform that is conducive to and in fact encourages people to upload copyrighted content. You allow that platform to have knowledge that copyrighted content is on their platform. You allow those digital services to monetize that content and yet there is very little that copyright owners can do. Um, I, I think it's funny that, um, or interesting, I believe that um, that you know litigation has been raised a number of times here as as a problem. Um, I, I would actually say, as somebody who litigates in the copyright area, it's it's actually very very difficult to bring copyright infringement litigation today against most digital services because of the safe harbors within the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, I would also say that with respect to the notice and takedown program under the DMCA, that also in terms of the, the burdens is, is much more burdensome on copyright owners, most of whom are fairly small business owners, if not individuals. And uh, the last time I checked my statistics, I think that at least with respect to YouTube, there is something like, you know, a hundred million hours of video uploaded every day or every 24 hours. And so it is almost impossible to actually enforce your rights in the digital environment. And so I would say that any move to reform copyright law should really focus on how to improve enforcement of the laws that we already have. Um, I actually, uh, Professor Olson, think it's, it's interesting that you say that in essence because some people break copyright laws we should get rid of the copyright law. Um, I, I actually disagree with that. I actually think most people abide by the law and try to find legal avenues to obtain copyrighted content. And these days online there's actually many, you know, ways to obtain. There's tons of services that are legal, allow you to you know, access music, movies, photographs, any kind of copyrighted content without having to obtain that illegally. And most people, I think, choose to do that where that access is as easy or almost as easy as, as pirating those works. Um, I, I would say that, you know, it's a small percentage of people who do a very large amount of um, piracy online. Um, the second point that I would make is that, and I think a lot of people have made it on this panel today, is that th there is just an unbelievable amount of government regulation in, in specifically in copyright, and especially in my area of practice, which is music copyright. Uh, with respect to, for instance, music publishers and songwriters, uh, two out of the three copyrights that we operate under are under government compulsory licenses or government issued uh, consent decrees, uh, which act as de facto compulsory licenses, because these co compulsory licenses and these consent decrees essentially take away a copyright owner's ability to say no. No, you cannot use my work. No, I'd like to negotiate how you're going to use my work, or how much I should be paid, or what conditions should be on, on the, not just my idea, but the, really the expression of my ideas, my, my property. Um, there is no ability to do that when there's government regulation requiring you to provide your copyrighted works to others. We have found where there's government regulation that it's actually highly inefficient. It's highly inflexible. It does not keep up with the changes to technology. I, I would argue that any uh, copyright law reform has to focus seriously on lifting a lot of these regulations and allowing the free market to work 
allowing parties to negotiate in a free market. And I would say, with respect to your daughter's Taylor Swift video, that because of free market negotiations between music publishers and songwriters and YouTube, um, there are licenses in place, and that video would actually not be illegal. You can upload that, and YouTube can put advertisements on that, and content owners and copyright owners, like Taylor Swift, can make sure that they are actually profiting from, you know, people who want to view that and, and any, any advertising revenue that gen is generated because of that video. And that is because of the free market. That is because YouTube has gone into the market and to their credit, done a lot of market deals with copyright owners and content creators to establish a system where people can benefit. And I think that we need to let that happen in other areas of copyright law. We need to lift some of the regulations and we need to ensure that the free market is allowed to operate and allowed to solve some of our problems. Because there are problems. I think whatever side of copyright, whatever you believe with respect to copyright law, um, everyone agrees that the system right now, particularly in the area of music copyright, is broken um, and can be fixed. I would, I would posit that allowing a process, a free market process, to create a solution would be the best way to move forward. Um, placing more regulation, placing more compulsory licensing, um, I think will just further uh, make the system inflexible and make it non-responsive to continued changes in technology which are likely to happen. Um, and this is not just, I mean, the former Register of Copyright, uh, Mary Beth Peters, recognized as much. With respect to the music composition, wor musical work rights, which is something that I focus on most of my time, um, we operate under a compulsory license for mechanical rights under Section 115 of the Copyright Act. And, and she, before the House Judiciary Committee, um, has said, you know, and did say before that, that Section 115 should be repealed and that the licensing of rights should be left to the marketplace. Um, and, and I'd like to note that in most countries um, that at one time had compulsory licenses in, in the music space and for musical works, most of those compulsory licenses have since been repealed and market collective licensing structures have been put into place. Um, and so I think I'll stop there since I just ran out of time. But you know, to, to summarize, I would say that there does need to be reform. I think that um, looking at copyright as, as something that is property in the same way that, and has the same protections as real property is something that can coexist with technology as, and the development of technology, and allows probably for the most flexibility and the best value to copyright owners, to new copyright, uh, new creators who want to use that copyright, and to users who want to access those works. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank all the speakers for going over time to the exact same degree. <laughs> Keeping it a fair fight. You know, the Federalist Society began life uh, with a mission of bringing debate to law school campuses, which were essentially uh, monolithic uh, and, and lacking debate. And having succeeded in that mission uh, to a great extent, have now... Um, uh, use this National Lawyers Convention occasion every year to bring together uh, libertarians and, uh, and uh, conservatives uh, to uh, duke it out, um, even, uh, <coughs> pardon me, yeah, even in a, uh, 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 although in a good spirit, I should say. In this context, it seems to me quite unclear who's the conservative and who's the, the libertarian. The lines of cleavage are a little bit, a little bit askew of that, I think. But there are sufficient differences aired here today that I think um, we should be able to stimulate um, quite a Donnybrook in the next couple of minutes. You know, the role of a moderator in these events is <clears throat> to uh, identify conflicts, um, uh, encourage them, and then throw kerosene on the flames at the end of that so that, um, so that everyone's had a good time. Now, we've heard that the copyright regime is derived ultimately from, I think it was the statute of 1689, was it? Or 1289, pardon me. I think there was something. Right, right. And then we have the 1909 Act, the 1976 Act. We've had brief reference to piano rolls. 
For those of you who don't know what piano rolls are, they're the predecessor to the Blackberry. Um, and not knowing anything about this Swift tailor, I'd like to find out where I could get a, a suit fixed. All right. That, that said, I take it, uh, just to get things going, that, uh, Mark, you have some differences uh, with um, at least what Mr. Olson said, and I think perhaps some others as well. I want to take a minute and a half to deal with those. Uh, only a minute and a half. Uh, where to be? Okay, 30 so, minutes. Uh, I, I, think, I think some of, of David's criticisms of the copyright system are, are, on the one hand, too abstract, and on the other hand, miss the mark. Um, let me start with how they missed the mark in some ways. He, he expresses a lot of concern about people uh, making transformative uses, you know, using other people's works to create stuff about amateur content and speech. Those are important values. Um, but a lot of, of copyright professors and classes and, and discussion online obsesses about that facet of copyright law. But what we should remember is that copyright's main function is to secure the investment somebody has made in a work, uh, in creating a work, which is a tremendous upfront investment. And the main way it secures that is simply preventing it from being pirated, from being literally copied. It's not, it's, its main economic value isn't so much in stopping somebody from making a movie that's too much like somebody else's movie, um, whether it's an amateur or professional movie. Its main economic value is in protect, giving people solid, dependable property rights so they have a, they can make investments and make their plans in life and in the commercial market. And so, so Dave's missing that point. The other point that's too abstract is his concern about, uh, his concern that copyright allows for monopoly pricing because after all, we can distribute works at zero marginal cost today. Well look, on, in a law review article, uh, you can write down an, abs an equation that says that, uh, but in the real world, when you talk to creative companies, when you talk to creators, you realize that that zero marginal cost is an utter fallacy. Um, it takes a lot to bring works to the market. It takes, there's hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in a variety of platforms, dozens of platforms for delivering video content and music. Um, it's, that is not zero marginal cost distribution. And we all know Netflix is experiencing challenges with its distribution. It's not zero marginal cost when it pays for bandwidth. Um, and furthermore, monopoly pricing, come on, in the creative market you have a vast number of competitors. You can't engage in true monopoly pricing. What we have is what's called monopolistic competition. People may uh, may be able to charge a little more for some valuable works, but if you went to the movie theater tomorrow and somebody told you the ticket was $50, most of you would leave and you'd go, you'd buy a book, you'd watch something on TV. They don't have a monopoly. They don't engage in monopoly pricing. Daniel, 90 seconds. Demolish him. <laughs> oh, me? I'm sorry. I thought you said Daniel. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, yes. I, I, sorry. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Just a few points. Uh, um, so copyright's main purpose uh, to make sure rights holders uh, get paid and all. I mean, we can debate about that. I, I've never said that I think because copyright is a regulatory regime uh, that piracy is great, right? So there's, that's not a link up, right? We, uh, DC gives out taxi medallions. Uh, it gives an exclusive right to uh, drive the taxi to only those who have taxi medallions. I would never suggest that just because that's an exclusive right, I don't think a property right, uh, I wouldn't suggest that it's right for people to go out and fake uh, taxi medallions and drive their own taxis, right? The, if, the, if the government has a regulatory system and gives certain entitlements or gives certain uh, privileges or rights, it doesn't mean it's, uh, it's okay for others to then cheat and, and you know, steal. I, I wasn't saying that at all. Um, of course we can't, uh, a business can't sell it at zero for everything, for marginal cost, that would never work. They have to sell at prices that cover average total costs, that cover their costs, 
But the point is, because the marginal cost of delivering additional content is so low, if they could adequately price discriminate, if they could pick out those people who would pay a very low price for something or nothing, uh, if they could sell to those people and not have them transfer it, then they would sell to those people and everyone would be better off for it. The companies would make more money and these consumers would get it. This is why uh, going to digital first sales is a terrible idea. No offense, but uh, it, it, it would stop that kind of price discrimination, which in a zero marginal cost world is a wonderful thing. Finally, monopoly pricing doesn't mean you get to charge whatever you want, right? Monopoly pricing means you just get to charge higher than, uh, than the competitive price by some amount. So just because you can't charge $50 doesn't mean you don't have some price that's uh, above the competitive. Um, let's see, Katie. Um, Google. Um, has been um, excoriated as a facilitator of uh, infringements, right? Vertical search, for instance, that can bypass the original producer, let's say the, uh, the uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune, and um, find the article through Google. So tell me why it is that, um, that uh, when you say the U.S. is doing a good job in protecting copyright, um, why it is that uh, what, Google, what Google does to that extent is not, uh, in fact, um, abetting infringements? Um, well, I think just as a factual matter, if we look at the issue of publishers, um, I think I have to disagree with that premise because um, any publisher has the ability within Google search to uh, you know, opt out of appearing in search. There's a little you know, text file they can do. The fact of the matter is publishers, both in the US and abroad, um, wants to appear in search because of the billions of um, users that it drives back to their sites. And I think you're seeing for each of these vertical industries um, challenges brought on by you know, the new digital environment, but many different media and content companies really thriving um, in terms of using the internet with very smart strategies to appeal to users, to develop monetization strategies um, in a way that especially for artists from an artistic perspective is incredibly compelling because not only can you now create your work and distribute it in a one-way channel out to users, but what we've seen with, I think, the dawn of the internet is a real change in the content community into this two-way interaction. So if you're a publisher, you can get comments from your users. If you're a songwriter, your song may go viral on YouTube and tens of thousands, and this actually happens all the time, of your fans make their own version um, because of technology that's enabled us to identify copyright rights holders, the original um, creators get the revenue stream from the ads, but you also get um, mass marketing appeal and I think your kind of artistic um, goals are also really rewarded by seeing your work um, used by you know so many people around the world and there's really great um, quotes from artists who've kind of shot to number one um, speaking about that. So I think you want to have smart enforcement tools. You know, on search, we do have ways in which rights holders can let us know to remove stuff. But the, the biggest shift that we've seen actually is four years ago, the majority of rights holders using these tools would set to block. So they would tell Google, when you identify my content block, and today the vast majority do not set to block. I think this maximalist, um, you know, idea is really waning in the real world and people want to leave it up, but of course they want to be part of the economic system so that they can recoup revenue. So Daniel, what are you complaining about? It's good for you. you <laughs> it gives you distribution, well, your records well, go right to the top, you can stop selling t-shirts and actually get paid for the music. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately songwriters don't really sell t-shirts and they don't tour, so we really do, you know, rely on um, ensuring that people license and pay their royalties because that is primarily how songwriters uh, make their living and can continue to write songs. Um, you know, I think, I, I think that, is, that is partly right. I, I would say that probably most artists have switched from wanting to block content to wanting to see their content on YouTube. Uh, I, I would, I would say that that's probably coincided with the increase in, in licenses so that people are now assured that where they see their content on YouTube and it is monetized, they are actually participating in the monetization of that content. Um, it's amazing how that will change your view as to whether or not people can use your copyrighted content. Um, 
Uh, I, will, I will say this, look, most digital services, uh, whether it's YouTube or Vimeo or Dailymotion or, or in the audio only area, SoundCloud, they, they know and they benefit from the use of copyrighted content on their platform. YouTube wouldn't be YouTube if it was still primarily a site where people uploaded ballet videos of their daughters and set it to, you know, Disney music. It, it is what it is because of the um, unbelievable, mostly copyrighted content that is shared via the site, um, which is now, you know, in large part licensed, which is great. Um, I think that I think that the more that that services partner with content owners, um, the better it will be for everyone because I think that allows the platforms to grow. I think that allows copyright owners to benefit and that way be more open to their content being on those platforms. And I think it's win-win for everyone. And I think you've seen that where there are partnerships in the market between digital services and copyright owners. Um, it is genuine, genuine, uh, generally highly beneficial to all parties. Usman, do you have a dog in this fight? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, uh, we sit at a very similar position the we at eBay. Uh, we at eBay, yeah. Sit in a very similar position to Google where we have a lot of strong partnerships with rights owners and and work to tackle uh, the problem of infringement online. And I, I would even argue that it, there has been a lot of positives on that. Katie mentioned uh, something like how many millions of links, 42 million links or something were taken down. On our platform, we have 42,000 rights owners that are signed up and we actively tell them if we think something is infringing, we help them take it down. It's a very cooperative, iterative process um, to, to try to, to, to combat this problem. And I would say it's better than the world we used to live in where this stuff was happening outside of their purview, right? This stuff is now in a place where we can track it and help, help to kind of combat the problem. Okay, well, thank you all. Now let's, uh, oh, do you want to have a rebuttal? Well, uh, I just, briefly. I want to make the point though that although uh, eBay and Google do do work hard to take down links to very specific files as required by the DMCA. They don't take down people's content. So I did a little empirical research on the stage here and I typed in download Guardians of the Galaxy. Eight of the first ten results on the front page are to torrent sites or illegal sites. Now the two non-infringing one, one is to Google Play. They'll, they're willing to sell it to you. The other second result's iTunes. But what you see is a list of repeat offenders here, sites like kick-ass torrents, which always comes up when you do these kind of searches. It's the first result. Let me, and let me so, write that down. And so uh, <laughs> there you go. And so Google, Google does what it's required to under the DMCA, which is a late 90s copyright law, which was meant to create a situation where, you, where we quarantined infringing files long enough to go to court and get them taken down. Isn't that laughable? I mean, you can't quarantine files on the internet. It's a chronic condition. Piracy is a chronic condition that has to be managed. And when a company knows uh, that there are a bunch of files on this page, guardians of the galaxy that have no business being here and yet has no obligation to do anything, which it arguably would under traditional principles of tort law, there's a problem. And it can't really put a halo on its head for taking down 200 million links when it allows those links to pop up seconds later to the same site for the same content, just a different file and a different link. I'm so glad that you brought up that example, um, actually, because it gives us an opportunity um, just to explain a couple new features that we've done. So first, just as an empirical, you know, factual matter, I think the query that you typed in, and there's some good data out there, if you just go to Google search trends, it's publicly available. The vast, vast majority of users type in what you'd expect, a movie name or an actor. So the example we're already starting with here is one that is probably, you know, one in 200,000 type query where you're adding in multiple extra words, download, free stream, watch online. That's actually not consistent with user behavior. But to the extent we're talking about this, you know, one or five percent type of query, I do think it's important to think about what types of links are showing up. So that example um, actually introduces a brand new product feature that we've been working on in the last year. The center card that you're seeing there in the middle, very prominently displayed, is a new format where you have the icons of 
various authorized platforms. And so even if a film, um, you know, is not uh, being distributed um, on mass online and it's difficult to find authorized links to populate, what we're trying to do is present users with a very compelling center card where regardless of what they've typed into that query, they can click in one button to their mobile device and get to an authorized place and purchase so that the rights holder will recoup. Is there any legitimate sale made by kick-ass torrents? I'm not familiar with that site. Well, why not? Why isn't I, the whole can, site blocked? I can assure you that we as a company would lose money if any consumer clicks to a link that's not authorized, but we would share revenue and the rights holders would get the majority of it if they click through to play. So from our most selfish perspective, we would definitely want to direct the user um, to the authorized platform. And then, of course, you do have as a backstop the DMCA to send the removals for the files. You have to do that in a careful way because although the majority of people sending us the notices use them to target accurate links that are infringing, the same tools are used around the world. And so as you see repressive regimes send Google when there's more pro-democracy protests, you, or in the United States, if you have competitors sending anti-competitive notices against their competitors, you still have to have mechanisms to weed out the abuse of notices and to not be overbroad or punish innocent websites. Thank you, Kate. All right, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, and they should be directed either to an individual or two, but not to me. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. By the way, I cannot see well because of the light, so. Um. In the 1980s, uh, the Copyright Office and the Copyright Royal Commission were doing incredible things. We got together and we put together a seminar about raising the public awareness. And as a result of that seminar, an Oscar Hunstein III spoke, someone from your tradition, the son of your employer. And he said, um, if you could take a machine that literally I think it was it not you, Jim? Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question briefly. Uh, so, so the, the briefly the question is: um, uh, In the past, there have been uh, kind of campaigns, uh, including a campaign I wasn't aware of, uh, that said uh, copying music. If you see it physically, like copying someone's sheet music and giving it out, is like copying uh, cassette recorders, whatnot. It, it, it's and the, if we see enough of this, we realize it's all just like real property. Um, and this makes uh, children and students realize it's bad and, and stop and, and reduce doing it. And, and what's the state of play now uh, as far as attitudes towards copying? Uh, I, I think the state of play is because of sensible moves uh, in industry, right? Uh, whether it be iTunes or Google Play or Spotify, Pandora, because of sensible ways of trying to say, look, uh, we, we, we want to stop piracy where we can. We're never going to stop it all. If we can make this stuff available legally, relatively cheaply, then a lot of people will opt into that. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, it was very effective of the recording industry to go out and sue lots of college kids for lots of money to get out the message of, hey, this is not only illegal, but we'll come after you. And so, so that was effective to some extent. And, and, and let me just say, if I might, Your Honor, uh, I've never said that... I'm not saying piracy is good. Piracy isn't good. It needs to be stopped. Copyright law works. We, we should have copyright law. It's great. We just need to reform it where we're needed. <clears throat> the reason you couldn't hear the question is that I didn't see there's a line at the microphone <laughs> because the microphone is right under that light. <laughs> so I, I vaguely see someone there. You'll have to sort of self-organize. Please. 
pay attention to the voice from the light. <laughs> <laughs> and, and identify yourself uh, in case somebody tries to copy you. <laughs> um, Adam Mossoff, professor at George Mason University School of Law. And um, it, I, it, uh, it, this is a question that's prompted by uh, uh, David Olson's um, raising of the, uh, the comparison of copyright and other IP rights to taxi medallions, which has become a very common um, analogy that one hears now today from a lot of uh, critics of intellectual property rights on the right. And, I was, and I've yet to hear um, comments uh, from people who are defenders of IP about what they think about that. So I suppose this is primarily directed to uh, Mark and Danielle as to what is your view of this, of, of this equivalency between taxi medallions and, um, and copyright? So starting Danielle, with you want to take that first? I'm going to give that to Mark. Oh, OK. Did you oh, come yeah. over here by Uber? Yeah. 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 So Mark. I did, in fact. So. so I find that analogy utterly appalling and manipulative. Um, da David, it, it's kind of beneath you. You know what you're doing when you say that to this audience. And I, I, I had it pulled on me in a debate at American Enterprise Institute. You know that that's probably like the worst thing you could say to this audience, right? That something's like a, a regulatory, something that's granted by regulatory fiat, a piece of crony capitalism, you know, quasi property given away by the government to its favored friends. Yes, exactly. Um, that, that's that's such a crock. Agreement. You, the the, the, the <laughs> look when we talk about copyright, we're talking about the intellectual labor of creators, people. Who've, who've used their mind to reorder the outside world according to their vi vision. Great painters, great movie makers. Spielberg, uh, Sp Spielberg, Twain, Hemingway, others. They have created something. They've brought forth something from nothing. And who deserves to benefit from that? Who deserves to own it? Uh, who has the better moral or economic claim to own it? Them. They should benefit from the fruits of their intellectual labor, both for their own life benefit and for others. And to co compare it to a taxi cab down, that's cheap rhetoric. Mark, so you would say it's like building a table or a chair? Yeah. Any, okay, any so now in that case, should it be perpetual? N no, there, there are complex why reasons why it should not be. The table um, is perpetual. It's that, my great-great-grandmother built that table. <laughs> so, so when, you, when we talk about intellectual property rights, they, they have a, a more natural exp, uh, expiration uh, it, for the benefit of the community and for others. Uh, they need to expire eventually, and it's, it's kind of a complex explanation, but it's, it, it's perfectly valid to have them expire after, after the creators derive their benefit and they've gotten back the benefit they've created for society. But it does outlive the creator, right? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, in some cases, yeah. A generation, two generations, maybe. So, yeah. Thanks to Sonny Bono. Next. At, le at least in theory. Of course, it, re it really lasts about five minutes on the internet. <laughs> That's if it can be digitized, right? Yes. Nicholas Chidiak from Barnes and Thornburg. Uh, a lot of these issues come down to transaction costs, the great difficulty of content creators to be able to detect, have takedowns, and block infringing content. On the other side, the um, tremendous difficulty in efficiently um, allocating very specific permissions and collecting what would typically be um, smaller fees, right? That it's for, um, you know, if Taylor Swift's could, it would make some sense to collect, you know, three pennies or something from the um, girls who dance and, and ha want to put up those videos, sort of have those kinds of structures for a lot of places on the internet. Um, how can we reform a regulatory structure to be able to address that better going forwards? Or alternatively, is this kind of a fool's errand? We better having a much more open system that would allow um, private systems to ASCAP was kind of rigid, but ha at least tried to serve the purpose of um, having these permissions much easier to get on a blanket basis. Is that directed at Danielle? Uh, just to the panel. You want to start? I'm ha yeah, I'm happy to. Um, look, I think if, if you're talking about kind of collective licensing structures that would make it easier for, you know, for it would reduce transaction costs on both sides, right? It would make it easier for people to license. It would make it easier to get licensed in the way that the performance rights organizations are structured now. The problem with the, the PROs is that they were structured for just that purpose, and 
uh, and then have been subject to heavy government regulation for the last 70 years, which has severely restricted you know, their ability to actually change and be flexible and, and develop with the developing technology and to ensure that the value that must be within creations because there is, um, as Mark said, actual cost associated with creating copyrighted works um, has been, you know, their, their ability to do that has been reduced. And so I think that having, I, don't, I have no problem, I think having collective licensing structures that help the efficiency on both sides is, is probably a good thing. I would say that, I, that it would be better and more flexible if those were in a free market so that people, you could really understand what the value is on both sides of the equation. I think free market negotiations would be the best way to understand what the real value should be of the content that you're licensing. Well, right now, I think you've objected to uh, the requirement of a blanket license for the entire catalog, is that right? No, not to, I, I, I object to the a compulsory license, which requires co copyright owners to provide their works without their permission, essentially. It basically sets rates, at least in our situation, every five years they set a rate and within those five years, anybody who gets that license can use your work for any purpose within that right, you know, whether or not you agree with what they're doing or disagree or and you have no ability to And is there just one license which covers everything? It's one, for, for the 115 license that I was referencing, it covers you, it's a one license for a work literally a song, oh, okay. but you can okay. you can get licenses for as, as many sure. works as you want sure. under the compulsory structure. Okay. If there's someone next out there, please. My name's Carrie Devra, and I established the Center for Copyright Integrity. I want to read my notes that were premised on what Katie said and the professor, but I want to start addressing collective licensing. Understand it means that all six of you at the end of the week are going to put your paychecks into one pot and then going to split it evenly. That's what's being proposed. Um, Katie, Google um, takes content without asking, and then this means then technically I can walk up to you and take your eyeglasses off your face because I like them. That's what's been happening with Google Images and Google Content. Um, addressing litigation, if people didn't steal, they wouldn't get sued. To the professor, if you think it's okay to work for free, then next week and every week thereafter, I'm stopping by your college classroom and I'm taking your paycheck. Because according to the premise that you're pushing, I think you've worked long enough too. Fair use is based on four factors. One of the factors that you misquoted is that if you present, prevent someone from earning a living from their content, it is not fair use. Orphan works, so people truly grasp the concept of it. It's if you don't know who the owner is, you just don't take it. But we have a problem with entities that Google such using metadata, um, bots that remove metadata, it's actually stripping the owners, the mummy and the daddy, so to speak, off the image. The phrase was, content is king, but there's a rest of the phrase that people have not been remembering. It says, and the content creator must be paid. If you think things are bad now in terms of the liquid litigations that are going on, watch what's going to happen with ICANN and the GTLDs. There is more chaos coming down the pipeline in 2015. So I'm going to sit. In the, um, in the what was the, uh, the Sonny Bono case that went to the Supreme Court? Elrod? Uh, Eldred, yeah. Eldred, thank you. One of the plaintiffs in that case was a firm that restored uh, films for which they were, that were disintegrating uh, tried to pr arrest them before they were gone entirely and to say if you don't know who owns it don't take it in that context meant if you don't know who owns it let it go let it disappear from the world because there's no way by which you can secure clear ownership to it clear title to it it's one of the, it's one of several differently situated plaintiffs that was cleverly included in the, uh, in the group there, to show, the, to make the point that extension of the copyright term would in that situation actually preserve works that would otherwise disappear. Let me present an imbalance to that. Content, a content creator owns something for life plus 70, but I have a bet that you've got something at home that's a family heirloom, possibly seven generations old. So why is it that you should keep your family heirloom and sell it and I cannot 
and other content creators cannot leave the family heirlooms they create to their kids because the law states that we can only keep it for 70 years past our life. Anyone want to defend that? I, I mean, I, I, okay. I, I think I could say something, but I think the views on both sides, have, it's well put, and I think views on both sides have been stated and there's more people waiting. Yes, we have uh, about uh, three minutes left, so if you would divide uh, the time equally and speak, let me, speak after, very quickly. After that, I could have uh, tried to respond to all of it, but actually, in, in, the, in this vein, sudden vein of cooperation and trying to get competing parties together after the election and, and look at sensible reform like the Keystone Pipeline, uh, I'm wondering uh, actually about Orphan Works again. Because I, I think the story the judge brings up, I do, I do research into pamphlets from the 30s and 40s. And I have no problem with the tenure of copyright. I have a problem that, that, that when this heirloom is not cherished and, and, it's not, and it's not identified, it's out in the garbage or out in the yard rotting, or, you know, in, 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 in unclear who owns it, I would think that's something we could get together on, that the default is potentially set incorrectly there, and 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 I think that uh, uh, Doug was the only uh, Doug Dave, uh, sorry was the only one that mentioned that. I re I really think that's an area that that there could be reform, that there might be some agreement on. Interesting suggestion, Doug David Daniel. <laughs> yeah. I, I adopt I adopt those remarks. <laughs> and next, hello, Derek Hora. I just wanted to ask whether or not anyone thinks that some of the arguments that come into play here might perhaps be viewed through a different lens when you're looking at some of the extension of copyright to characters, as in the case with the MGM case, uh, going after the, the James Bond alike in advertisement. Comments? Not really. I mean, I don't have a problem okay. with Wrong room. protecting characters. No, I, I, well, I, I, I think it does go to the point of uh, this isn't some you've created a table now no one should take it. Uh, it's very complex what we give uh, protection to and what we don't. There's lots of fuzzy lines. There's lots of choices that we're making in what we're going to give exclusive rights to and, and what we're not. So uh, uh, beneath me or not, I do think it's like a taxi cab medallion in that the government is saying there is a need here. There's a market failure. Here's how we're going to solve it. We'll give out exclusive rights. The reason Mark doesn't like the taxi cab medallion story is because Guess what? Government, when it tries to solve problems by giving out exclusive rights, sometimes does it really badly, and so it gives taxi medallions in ways that are often quite uh, crony and, and allow a lot of monopoly pricing. So it doesn't like the analogy because, oh, that's an example of government uh, giving out rights and doing it badly as far as the public interest is going. Well, that could never happen over here in copyright. Of course not. Government's, government's uh, uh, completely... Um, you know, uh, precedent when it comes to that. I dislike the analogy because it ignores the moral element that somebody created something of value that they deserve to own. Somebody, <laughs> somebody created the car, somebody insured the car, somebody's providing the driver, right? It's, you're, you're, you're facilitating, you're bringing all these things together uh, with the cab as well. The last question. Last question. Um, since we're talking about copyright reform, let me simply ask the panel, uh, should we consider moving toward a European-style moral rights regime, a away from the, uh, the current uh, American regime, which more narrowly defines the rights of artists? Very interesting question. Anyone who would take the affirmative on that? Well, I, I do. I mean, I, I think that I think the concept of moral rights is very interesting. I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure if you can completely adopt that structure here, but, but I think that the concept of, uh, of believing that somebody has moral rights to the works that they've created and the expression of their ideas is, I, I think, holds important. So Mark, if I make a painting and sell it for $100 and then later it's resold for 1000 I would get a share of that. Do you think that's a good that's idea? It's one of several aspects of moral rights, right. also rights of integrity and attribution. Right. Um, it, it's an interesting concept. It's not a real comfortable fit. Within yeah, the it's kind of system. French. Yeah, it's very French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the draw more off. Yeah. yeah. Oui. Okay. All right. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for this discussion. <laughs>